toppers. Uh, I just want to take a minute to thank you. Uh, for those of you who have joined at home and those of you who have traveled to USA Swimming's office today uh, for attending uh, my breaststroke technique and training ideas webinar. Uh, I hope that all of you had a good holiday training. Um, you had some time with your family and friends. And I wish you and your athletes the best of luck in the coming season. I'm here to talk about the way we teach breaststroke and train breaststroke at the University of Denver. The premise of my talk is that I'd like to take the technical concepts presented by Russell or articles in the swimming world and discuss how you can reinforce those biomechanical ideas to apply teaching and training to developing swimmers in a club program. My primary audience is high school athletes. And I think that a lot of the presentations are presented at such an elite level that it's important to, to understand how those ideas can be applied to a younger audience. It's important to note that this is our way. It's not the only way. There's a huge deviation between athlete skill levels, programs, lane space, available equipment. There's differences between training at altitude and at sea level. Our club is uh, in Denver. And I know that you'll find uh, variation in what's successful for your program based on what your athletes, the athletes that are in front of you. My goal is to create some common talking points and teaching points and then show a sample model of how I teach those and how we train based on those biomechanical concepts. Uh, feel free to submit questions during the presentation if it's more relevant or if it makes sense for me to answer as we go, I'll do my best to accommodate. So I thought that I'd open this morning with um, a video that gave some perspective to the sport. So without um, further ado, I'm going to go to my first uh, video. And I think that this should give, this is taken from the morning show. That was um, MJ. This isn't. Oh, there we go. Okay. So maybe this will give a little bit of perspective to. Um, this is actually about the origination of butterfly. That there were two different ways to compete breaststroke. Uh, this is from I think 1936. That's right, bud. Who have you got here? I have Chet Dispensky here from Indiana University. A uh, real fine spot. Well, let's Not see. Competitive. Get in there, Chet. Let's see what you can do now. This spot is one of the first strokes that was ever written uh, up in any uh, periodical. You'll notice that the swimmer uses alternate timing, first kicking, then pulling. The kick we describe as a frog kick. The legs are drawn up underneath the body and then thrust backward with the force coming from the instep of the foot. I would Sean, I'm just going to interject for a second. I want to pause the video. Um, there is actually sound going on for you, those of you who are listening in. And the volume control for the sound is on the lower right hand corner of each video. So if you cannot hear the audio that is being played, go ahead and move that vo volume control all the way to your right. Um, and then we're just going to um, skim this back just a couple of seconds so that you can hear the information. So each video has its own separate control. So when you're listening to, um, or when you're watching the video, if there is sound, if it's too loud or too soft, you can control it that way. And I think this is the only one that has sound, but here we go. Periodical, you'll notice that the swimmer uses alternate timing, first kicking, then pulling. The kick we describe as a frog kick. The legs are drawn up underneath the body and then thrust backward with the force coming from the instep of the foot. I would say that in this stroke, most of the power, particularly in the 220 race, speed chest, So I just thought that was a good lighthearted way to get the morning started with some uh, head up, frog kick, breaststroke. And uh, I'm going to move along to what I would perceive to be 
the um, kind of the origins of what I know as modern breaststroke. And this might uh, show my age a little bit, but um, Mike Barrowman, I'm going to give him credit to him and his coaches for what I perceive to be making a great jump in stroke mechanics and training methods. So, MJ, this isn't, there we go. If you, as you watch this video, you're going to see that most of the things that I am going to talk about today and that I'm going to uh, technically are really in place here. Um, you're going to talk about a wide outsweep, the timing of the kick, and uh, uh, several technical aspects that if you were to go back and look at this video again at the end, I feel like the breaststroke mechanics that um, that Barrowman was racing with would hold today. I think that they were, um, it was an excellent example and really in my mind the uh, the, the beginning of what people are studying now as a, as a modern breaststroke. So back to the presentation. Um, some beginning concepts for the way that I look at um, coaching breaststroke and really I think all strokes. I think it's really important to observe your athletes to key in on what is successful for them. Uh, one of the modern day examples of the development of Rebecca Sony, if you listen to Tom Spiegling or Dave Salo talk about her stroke mechanics and how things were created for her, that she didn't have an exceptional pull or an exceptional kick, but she had great core strength. So even starting as far back as high school, uh, they, it was identified and through observation and trial and error, her stroke mechanics were created from something that worked for her, not necessarily something that was traditional or that had been done before, but just from observation. Um, keep an open mind. Experiment. And, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that when what might be successful for a group of athletes that you have today may not, it may change as those athletes grow or as your group grows or again as your lane space or your availability equipment changes that you continue to look at different ways to make the best, you know, the best training environment for those athletes. Uh, most of the methodology in our program has been developed through trial and error. It's just us, the athletes and I, giving feedback to try to find out what, what they enjoy, what they like, what benefits them the most, and again, always measuring by how much faster they're getting. Uh, moving on to some other more specific uh, big scale ideas. Uh, we talk about trying to maintain the lowest possible ratio of time with the head or the torso above the water versus below the water. And I really believe that one of the, if you look at the stroke, all of the high resistance positions come during the breath when the head is out of the water. The hips drop, the knees drop, you pull in your heels up. All of the things that you're trying to get through as quickly as possible are happening in the middle of the breath. So moving on to the next one, I, we really try to emphasize prior, or prioritize lowering resistance before we try to increase propulsion. I think that it is a more efficient way to improve. I mean, you're creating efficiency. It's a quicker way to improve. And if you've got to make a choice between making them stronger or teaching them, I think that especially in breaststroke, because it's the highest risk resistance stroke, that teaching them how to become more efficient is going to make them improve quicker. Um, a lot of the way that we teach is by isolating specific body positions that focus on the timing of the breath and the timing of the kick. Um, the, the, the movements or the body positions that we're going to isolate, I feel like are common to elite breaststrokers. And I'm going to show a bunch of video with athletes that look very different, but they have, they all move through the same points. The breath is created the kick is created with, with almost identical body positions, even though they might look very, very different from over the surface. 
when we swim fast in workout or in meets, we focus a lot more on the flow of energy and the connection of kick or their momentum from the end of one stroke into the next stroke. Um, they're just, and to keep in mind on this topic, their distance per stroke will change within a season, depending on how fresh their legs are, how, where you're at, if you're doing any strength training, how heavy their workload is. It will change from season to season. I always, you know, strength, fitness, and power are going to evolve as an athlete evolves, and you're going to get different um, different effects from different age athletes. So the the integration of rhythm and the focus of rhythm has to be something that they're constantly attentive to, because they're going to be getting different distance per stroke. They're going to be, uh, you know, producing a different amount of power depending on where they're at within the season. I think it's really important to keep them connected to that in workout as they're going through their training progression. So moving on to some key technical concepts. These are things that we talk specifically about. And again, I think they're things that are common to all fast breaststrokers, um, or almost all. When, when you go through these, I want you to think from front to back. I want you to think starting in their glide, and then think to through the out sweep to the catch, to the breath, to the lunge, to the kick, and then back into the next stroke. I think that's the easiest way for swimmers to retain the knowledge while they're training is that you start from front to back. So the first one is that they should be trying to time the breath with the widest part of the stroke. And there is a lot of variation here. I'm going to show a video later of a higher tempo breath stroker with uh, a narrower catch than maybe somebody than the athlete next to her. But I think the key talking point is to synchronize the initiation of the palm of the hand turning from outward to inward with the breath. And I think that's something really easy for even younger athletes to remember is that as your palm turns from outward to inward, that's when your the back of your head is supposed to break the surface. So by breaking it down to that point, it's something that an eight-year-old, a ten-year-old, a twelve-year-old uh, kid that's trying to make sectionals or junior nationals can remember because it's just a simple turn of the hand that they're supposed to time the breath with. Um, the catch in breaststroke, once they get to the widest part of the stroke, I think it's just like butterfly or backstroke or freestyle. You have to have a vertical forearm angle. And I think it's, it's just as important. It doesn't work quite the same way in that they're not pulling straight back, but it is absolutely critical to them holding the water and being able to move their hips and their legs up underneath them. Uh, their spine line. No neck movement, no back arch, and minimize the hip drop. And in most of these videos, these athletes are not actually dropping their hips at all. In fact, at this point, uh, most of the elite level breaststrokers have uh, their hips stay almost totally flat throughout the stroke. The neck movement, I think, is probably one of the most common errors in all of breaststroke is that kids lift their head to take a breath. And I feel like the neck is a trigger to the rest of the back and that they're much more likely to arch their back if, if they're moving their head to take a breath. So we do tennis ball drills and some other things to eliminate neck movement and really get them to focus on the longest spine possible. Uh, the next one is the pull ends at the width of the rib cage. I think that this kind of goes hand in hand with um, the, the the talking point below that the hands should be moving forward by the time they make contact with each other. Again, I think that this is an easy way to teach your younger kids something that they can remember and something that they can think about constantly is if their hands are already moving forward towards their glide by the time they touch, they're not going to get stuck in the middle of the stroke. They're not going to end up with their hands right up against their chest or way down underneath them. They've already released the pole, and it's diving forward. Uh, the fifth one is to recover thumbs dry, hands wet. And there is a lot of variation here. I've had athletes that were, you know, I mean, if you think back to Scott Usher, he barely kept his elbows in the water, whereas some athletes are pinky fingers, and some athletes are probably just a little below the surface of the water. But Again, something easy that you can talk to your athletes about is thumbs dry, hands wet. They can remember that while they're in the middle of a hard training set 
or again, if they're younger, they're 10, 12, they can remember to keep their thumbs on the surface and the rest of their hands underwater. Um, the timing of the kick, we really try to get them, again, to key in on the moment when their elbows lock. And there is some variation to this, but I'm going to show you quite a few different brush strokes that end up locking or timing the kick at the time that, that they're, the athlete's elbows are locking in to glide. <coughs> the, um, the key is to capitalize on the momentum and really just try to maximize the energy that was created by lifting their torso over the water and getting it to translate into forward momentum. The top of the kick, uh, we talk, the, the knee position should be about the width of the hips. Um, there is a lot of variation on this, and I, but I think that much outside the hips, they're going to be incurring resistance on the outside of their thighs. Um, we also talk about trying to get your feet turned out at the top of the kick. Uh, that's, that's the challenge for those that are not blessed with uh, knee and ankle flexibility, is getting a good angle with in their ankle. Something else we talk about is a vertical shin angle. And I actually think that the vertical shin angle is as important as foot position, if not even more. If you think about the way that you teach um, a catch on freestyle, you talk about the surface area of your hand versus the surface area of your forearm and your hand. I think that the shin angle on breaststroke is very similar in that if you're from knee to ankle, you have a vertical shin angle. As you initiate the push, you have a lot more surface area working to your advantage. The, um, the next one is a direct foot path. A lot of you, I'm sure, have seen uh, kicks that kick straight out to the side and end up out to the side, and then they sweep back in with their legs straight. Uh, a pretty direct kick path is going to provide not only good propulsion, but it's going to allow the stroke to evolve at a relatively competitive tempo. If it takes too long for your feet to get from the top of the kick to the close, you're going to, it's just going to take time and you're going to lose power. So, and, and this is a really common, common flaw. And I'm going to show a couple, uh, one particular thing later that we do to try to help our athletes understand better what a direct foot path looks like and feels like. Uh, the finish of the kick. Um, and this is another really common flaw, especially with younger kids, but I've had many older athletes that had no awareness of this. Uh, the finish of the kick that you're trying to really synchronize your knees locking as the ankles are touching so that the, the leg is working together. And the most common flaw with this is that they will, athletes will lock with their legs or ankles at the width of their shoulders. And I really think that it's important to emphasize that the destination of the kick has to end with the knees and the ankles in synchronization. Um, and back to rhythm. Each one of these is, is a point in the stroke, like an isolated snapshot of the stroke. I think rhythm is what weaves all those together. So again, that just goes back to the connection of the kick through the outsweep and into the next catch, and really being able to go from, from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 seamlessly and with good energy. So um, I'm going to move into some videos that hopefully uh, display this. Um, we're going to start with an underwater shot of breaststroke. And this particular video, the athlete's a little further back than, than, I, would, um, than I would like. But the, the nice wide position, you're looking at the, the catch being synchronized with the palms turning. Um, the pull does end prior to hands actually touching. They're moving forward right there by the time they make contact with each other. Really tight, nice glide line. And then um, kind of in the next, you know, in, in the next, this, uh, this is a familiar face. Um, the next evolution step is that Kitajima really was quicker. And if you can look at the difference when we get back to the underwater shot, 
he released a little bit earlier and was a little quicker through the middle of the stroke. And um, But really, I think that the strength of this, as you can see, is the way that he drops in and really maintains his momentum into his glide position. Um, and if you think back through those things, again, just looking at the timing of the kick, he's going to time the kick with the elbow lock. And uh, really, he was excellent, excellent with distance per stroke and, and keeping his momentum from from the initiation of the pole all the way through the end of the kick. And I'm going to move on to a video of uh, another familiar athlete. So this is a really good shot from the side of the vertical forearm angles. Um, the other thing that is really apparent is the hip positioning here. Um, she has lowered resistance uh, almost to the point that, 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 I mean, she's gone really far down that road. You can see how late she leaves her knees back. And we'll come back to this, and I'll, I'll let it loop again. Um, this is a good view of releasing, releasing the pull at the width of the ribs, hands moving forward by the time they make contact with each other. I'm going to go ahead and go back for that one again. So again, just look how late she leaves her knees back, waits, 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 and then gets her, her uh, feet pulled up behind her hips very quickly and with relatively low resistance. Great flat glide line. And again, excellent, excellent forearm angles. So another shot of um, a different um, American breaststroker. Really good forearm angles again. Also does a pretty good job. Probably not quite as good in uh, keeping her legs hidden, but the forearm angles on the front of the pole, the catch, is excellent. You see a nice foot angle on the kick, and she does have a little bit of an up kick on the end of her breaststroke pull, which is something I'm going to come back to at the end. But just look at where her knees and her ankles complete the kick. They're very narrow as they come back up, but um, I think you can see from this video that it's a pretty powerful movement. She's getting a lot of propulsion, a lot of distance per stroke out of uh, the way that the way the kick finishes. So um, to kind of bring um, some contrast to the way things look above the surface of the water. Uh, I think I thought that this was a really good video. That you're going to see that they have a very different breath angle um, above the surface, but underwater there's there's real similarities. Um, you can see the athlete on the left is is narrower, but still timing the breath with with the turn of the palm, um, still timing the kick with the elbow lock, and I'll come back to that shot in just a second. But over the surface. There's big variation in the angle of the breath, the spine line of their backs, and what you would normally see just from over the surface. But yet, when you look at it underwater, they're really doing very, very similar things at those key points that uh, I outlined before. I'll let this go through again. So um, I, I think that that's just a really good example of how differently things can look from over the surface 
when in reality they're still doing very, very similar things. And I've got, I'm going to, my next slide is going to actually be an example from athletes from my own team uh, that would uh, display this. I'm going to go to, this is a video of our sectional meet uh, from a year or two ago. And you can see, you'll see the four yellow caps. Those are our athletes. There's one in the four out of the five near lanes. And you're going to see that the timing of the breath, the out sweep, looks very similar in all four but their angle of breath is different. And this video is taking a little bit longer to load. So it'll be, it'll be coming here in a second. Okay. All right, here we go. So you can see that that's actually a pretty good freeze frame, kind of coincidentally. Um, that all four of those yellow caps, and even really the girl that's second, second from the top, uh, is from another lo local club in Denver. Uh, they all have probably five different angles of breath and recovery, but the way that they're creating that, the way they're coming out of their glide, is identical. So I just think it's really important to continue to reiterate that there's so much variation in breaststroke that things might look differently, but if you key in on certain points, you can really you can really help someone who might have either an anatomical difference or you know they have different flexibility or they have different strengths, you can help them succeed just by getting them through those key points. So I'm going to go back to our presentation here. And These are, these are the drills that, or this is a drill sequence that we use to uh, teach, again, from front to back, uh, to teach kind of those key points. And I'm going to go through them, explain them, and then I actually have a, a video of our own athletes doing these drills. Some of them are, I, I think they can all be learned. I would say everybody in our program knows these drills that it's 12 and older, but some of these drills are particularly effective for younger kids, especially this first one, uh, which is IY drill. Uh, the purpose of it is to teach the timing of the breath and to teach them to pause at the widest part of their stroke. And the biggest thing with younger kids is that they want to lift their head early and get back, get more oxygen, get back into the next breath. Um, so we really try to emphasize teaching them how to freeze frame with proper body position prior to the initiation of the breath. Uh, the next one is uh, piece by piece. And this drill is really designed to isolate the pole from the kick. And it purposely pulls them apart. It does not have any rhythm to it. It is more about, it's a very mechanical A to B to C type thought process where they're going to go through the pole, generate as much momentum as they can, dive forward into their glide, hold, hold the body position for a second, and then kick and glide for another second. Um, the next, the, the addition, next step is piece by piece with dolphin kick. And the addition here is that we add a dolphin kick prior to the breaststroke kick. And I think it's really important just to, to when we use dolphin kick, we always talk about kicking at the time that you want your feet to turn out. And so what they're actually doing is using the dolphin kick, which is a smaller, more compact kick, to try to feel the timing that they want to have when they add in a breaststroke kick. So this drill is they're going to dolphin kick as their elbows are locking, dive forward, glide, and then the breaststroke kick will actually connect into the next out sweep in a way that they can focus on the rhythm and momentum. The next drill is a delay kick build, which is going to start looking very similar to the uh, piece by piece drill, but they're going to slowly eliminate the gap between the pull and the kick as the 
as the 25 goes along. And you can do this long course as well, where you tell them to start with a delayed kick, build for 30 meters, and swim the last 20 meters fast with, uh, with good momentum. But you're purposefully starting with a late kick so that you can bring it into the pole and kick at the time that you want to kick, not just necessarily rely on what you've always done. Um, and the last one is a drill that probably 90% of the 90% of the uh, clubs in the country use is one pull, two kick. The, what I would emphasize again is that we talk about using the first glide to get your distance for stroke, and the, or the set first kick to get your distance for stroke, and then the second kick is really used to connect from the end of the kick and into the next stroke so that you're going through the out sweep with a lot of momentum. And that's really difficult to achieve without actually just sprinting. So we talk about it in a way that this is your opportunity to feel a really good connection from the end of your kick through the out sweep and into the catch on the next stroke without having to swim at high intensity. So I'm going to show, I see there's starting to be some questions coming in. I'm going to show our video uh, for drills and then um, I'll get, hopefully get to that in a minute. All right. So this is the IY drill, and you can see real simply, just pause at the widest part of the stroke. Her hands are still pitched outward. Um, this is piece by piece, which again, it's just a dissected pull, glide for a second, kick, glide for a second. Now we're going to add in the dolphin kick. You see that she should be dolphin kicking pretty much as her elbows are locking and as her momentum's dropping back into the surface. And then the next breaststroke kick that follows that, and I know the lighting on this is a little weird, um, just some glare off the water. Here's a delayed kick build. So you're going to see it start real similar to piece by piece. And then as the 25 progresses, she's going to tighten the timing and get into a good momentum breaststroke where the kick fits in properly. And then this is lastly uh, one pull, two kick. And you can see really with that one that she's got great momentum from one stroke diving back in and going back to those broad scoping um, concepts. I'm going to just play that again of trying to, to work on keeping the ratio of time that your head is below the surface versus above the surface. This, this drill is great for that. And it really encourages getting through the breath quickly and getting right back into a low resistance position. I think that that's a real good shot of that. Um, so I'm going to answer a couple questions. Uh, so as a teaching point, head is in a streamline throughout through the entire outward press of the hands. Uh, that is exactly what we teach. I think that it is really important to identify the any engagement of the neck and um, try to eliminate it until the hands turn, the palm of the hand turns from outward to inward. Um, MJ, how do I scroll down? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, there we go. Thanks. Uh, do you teach foot speed in the recovery with the kick? In some ways, you develop this in young athletes. I am about to get into the kick, and I think that I'm just going to let that. Um, I'm going to let that be my segue into the next section. I'm going to go back to our presentation. And while I'm looking for this, I see a question, is it possible to get the videos of the drills for your young swimmers to watch? This presentation will be recorded on the USA Swimming's website and uh, show them these videos um, at, at any time on, at workout. 
<laughs> okay, so next slide. Uh, we do a lot of work on breaststroke kick. I feel like not only does it does isolating the kick teach you how to create a better body body line, but it uh, develops their kick strength. And in a lot of situations, I feel like I don't want to train them on full stroke breaststroke once they fatigued. I mean, there is a a, a valuable part in training them to the point of fatigue and asking them to go a little beyond it so they know what their stroke is, what they're going to find at the end of a race. They know how to hold it together. They know exactly what aspect of their stroke is going to break down. But doing a significant amount of volume of breaststroke beyond their successful point, uh, I think, is a negative to the general of, of, of their stroke. So one of the ways that we extend the training time beyond what they can do, what I consider do well, is to do some kicking. And you'll see with our weekly plan how that fits in. Um, when we kick without resistance, we generally kick with a snorkel, um, either with a board or in their glide. And I usually am, uh, I let them choose which one they like. Uh, some of them like a slight upward shift of their hips as they close the kick. So they feel more comfortable in a, in a glide position, but I'm real really a stickler about them not using their arms and really forcing them to have a proper balance. Um, before I get into the, or to the resisted kicking, I think it's I, I'd like to credit Paul Bergen for giving me a lot of the information that I started with. Uh, he visited the University of Denver in 2008 to do some altitude training, and I got an opportunity to talk with him extensively about things he'd used with Allison Wagner and, and in his program over the years. And while a lot of this has morphed since 2008 and changed into different things that I thought were more applicable to our groups or more time efficient, he really is the one that started me thinking on how can I incorporate this concept into our program? How can I make it work for me? So uh, vertical kicking with weight. A um, couple years, about 2008, maybe a little bit before, I had bought a couple hundred pounds of scoop, coated scuba weight because I felt like uh, we use it for prehab for shoulders on land. We use it in a lot of different ways, but I also wanted to start doing weighted vertical kicking and a number of other things, and it just coincided that I ran into Paul and had a really good use for it. So he, just to give him some credit for uh, helping send me down this path. Um, the things that he used, the equipment that he used is a little bit different, but uh, still he, he generated kind of the initial thought process. Uh, the first one, vertical kicking with weight overhead. Um, I'm going to show a video here. The uh, things that we emphasize here are, again, knee position going back to the technical concepts that I talked, to, talked about before, keeping your knees at the width of your hips. Um, and that your knees and your ankles are touching in synchronization. And let's see if we can get this to go. You can see that she has really, really good body line. And uh, knee position is good, fairly direct foot path towards the, towards the bottom of the pool. Um, I know if any of you listened to uh, Tony's talk, uh, Passive Coach Tony's, about kicking and training, I think that one of the, again, one of the things that will that will set me off about doing this incorrectly is poor body line. If they're leaning forward or if they're they're not in a very very straight body line, then we'll stop and we'll start over, or they'll be told what they're doing wrong. <laughs> um, the, uh, the it's a major emphasis point for us, and uh, something that I think is critical to preventing injury. They really need to be in the right the right position. Um, going ahead to the next one, which is uh, med ball with snorkel. Um, basically, if I want to design something that's a little bit less stressful or a little bit uh, more towards give them time to think about uh, kicking across the surface and having their body line in the position where their elbows would be locking and kicking in a way that simulates where they should be kicking in breaststroke. Uh, we will we will do this where they might do five or ten vertical kicks at the end of each wall, and you can do this for all 
all strokes. I think that's one of the other things that is important is that almost all these designs, there are other athletes doing the same things with dolphin kick or flutter kick at the same time. Um, okay, so the next one is uh, the vertical swimming with a, with a weight belt. And this is, uh, when I bought the scuba weight, I also bought belts. So the way that we regularly use these is um, I will tell them that we're going to do hundreds. And each push off from the bottom represents the pull out. And then they have to do X number of kicks per length or per 25, so to speak. So what you're watching here is actually what we would call a vertical hundred. Um, it is hypoxic. It is really hard. Uh, they enjoy it a lot more than uh, just holding weight over their head and kicking for 15 minutes. Um, it adds a lot more variety. Uh, they get to work on their pullouts. And it really encourages high rate kicking. So the question about the foot speed, um, we do vertical kicking with our younger groups. And we emphasize body line first. But then we do talk about how to get your heels up. Um, I'll just let that play while I finish up. How to get your heels up quickly and the, the importance of your heels following the um, the movement of your hips. It uh, we we talk about in the groups that precede my group, and so by the time they get to my group, it's the the concepts are pretty pretty in there for those athletes, and they have a pretty good understanding of what I'm going to request. Now I add weight once I feel like they're physically mature enough to be able to uh, to do it properly, and and uh, you know again we emphasize proper form so that they're not, uh, I think they're not suspect to injury. If an athlete has any kind of knee pain then we or anything like that, we modify what they're doing. But I've had very, very few instances of that um, over the years. So I'm going to go ahead and go to um, the next. Uh, this is kind of more of a teaching method. Um, and this, I think you can address the ankle position. Uh, the top of your kick, your knee position, and um, you know the finish of the kick. And again, not everybody's going to have the equipment available to do this. But one of the things that I found was teaching your feet to get turned out at the top of the kick was really difficult. And without video, and even with video, it wasn't really, it didn't work as well as I wanted it to. Um, so a couple years ago, I bought uh, some mirrors, and there are multiple mirrors that you can use besides um, just the finesse mirrors. There's other ways to get uh, a reflection. But the, uh, this, this allows them to look at what they're doing with immediate feedback so that they can make adjustments to their knee position or their ankle position. Uh, the other thing that we do, and this is just to get them to start to work together a little bit more, is we'll do that exact same activity with a partner and just take a stretch cord. So if you've got a stretch cord that you would normally swim against for assisted and resisted and assisted swimming, uh, you, can add, you can partner a skilled athlete with a less skilled athlete and have them coach each other. And that way you get good interaction between teammates, you get good interaction. It, it just creates a pot positive work environment and they're learning several of the same things that they would see right there. Um, this doesn't have as much to do with the kick, but I thought this was just kind of a, a happy accident. I had this out, and uh, I, I had a girl that was having some problems with the breaststroke, which are going to become real apparent um, when she starts swimming. Her elbows are way too far back. She's getting stuck. Uh, you can see she's trying to pause at the widest part of the stroke, but way far underneath her body. And within just a couple minutes, and I know that this is, uh, again, this is a... Uh, a lower level breaststroker. I mean, this girl is just trying to make sectionals and get under 230 in the short course to her breast. But the effect of her making going from elbows way underneath her body to um, releasing the water at a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier and a little bit lower resistance position has been really uh, a positive change for her breaststroke. So I'm going to go back to the presentation and um, you just got it. Uh, just a couple more slides. So this is um, our weekly training plan. 
if we weren't to have a meet during school. And uh, when you think about this, like I tried to isolate the way that we use breaststroke. This frequently coincides with um, other people swimming their best stroke. And I'll kind of walk you through that as we go. But I do try to think about the breaststrokers in a little bit different way because if they're uniquely good to breaststroke and they're really not a flyer or a backstroker or a freestyler and they really enjoy training a lot of breaststroke, I think that it's important to create a stimulating and regular uh, sequence. So on Mondays we would do, uh, we would just generally do breaststroke kicking. We generally train freestyle on Mondays because they're coming off a day off. On Tuesday morning, uh, we would either end practice, and this isn't their main set, but this would they, they'd end practice with breaststroke pole with a buoy or breaststroke with fins working on a higher tempo breaststroke swimming. On Tuesday night, we would go 200 of stroke training. Um, and this is the hard training set of, of the week. If we're at specific times of the year, these might flip. Um, we get long course on Tuesday mornings. So some uh, we would, if we're gearing up for a long course meet, or if I wanted to just add some variety to, so that they weren't swimming three short course sessions breaststroke, we might do the 200 stroke training in the morning and then do the buoy or the, the, the pulling or the fins at night. But um, we almost always end Tuesday nights with a uh, vertical kick. And it's usually 12 to 16 minutes. The breaststrokers, the beauty of, the, of, of, of doing this is that they don't use a lot of lane space. You can put them all in lane one. And uh, you can let them do that. And the dolphin kickers do some resisted, uh, we actually do resisted kick on towers at the same time. So that, that you know, they kind of split into two groups. Um, Wednesday night, we don't isolate breaststroke, but we train IM almost every Wednesday night. Um, on Thursday mornings, we would do the other, if we polled on Tuesday morning, we would do breaststroke with fins at the end of practice. And again, while we're pulling, the breaststrokers will pull a breast-free mix. Uh, with freestylers recovery, the freestylers will pull freestyle at that same time. Or if you know if they're doing fins, the breaststroke will do fin stuff, and the other swimmers might be doing just breakout or 25 sprint speed or other stuff with fins. Uh, I just isolate the breaststrokers out so that they're getting that work in. On Thursday nights, uh, we do really high intensity, fast paced swimming, and this is best stroke training for everybody. Uh, breaststrokers do breaststroke, but a lot of stroke count controlled 25s leading into 50s and 75s. And the goal of that is if they're going top speed for 10 25s and then we do a 75 or top speed and then 8 25 sprint into a 75 or 6 25 sprint into a 75 and we go down that ladder, the goal is is that if they're really being aggressive on the 75s, they're finding out what what breaks down as they go through the second and third lap from their top speed and they can really challenge themselves to sustain that in the face of fatigue. Because that set is shorter in volume, uh, we'll go a little bit longer vertical kicking and the vertical kick could be any of those things that I just showed. Um, on Friday night, we do some breaststroke kick, but again, it's really just our general kicking. Uh, we do do a fair amount of kicking within the program. so. Uh, Mondays and Fridays might have 1,500 uh, worth of kick in a workout, and they would just choose to mix breaststroke in or not mix breaststroke in, depending on how they feel coming off a of Thursday. And on Saturday, if there's no meet, we are almost always off the block at the end of practice. So um, they get some high rest off the box sprinting. And how much, what percentage of that is breaststroke would be determined by, again, how they're feeling there at the end of the week. Uh, but usually I ask about 50% of the sets to be breaststroke. Um, a kind of a side note is we mix sculling for all swimmers into warm up and warm down throughout the week. So they are getting that work uh, pretty, pretty consistently. Um, I've got one more, one more uh, slide and one more video and then I'm going to come back and get as many questions as I can. Um, just to looking ahead, and I, and I showed the one video with the up kick on the end of breaststroke, I think that um, there's two things that, that you're going to see, especially in the 100, uh, long course 100. And Russell already did some studies, for those of you that were at convention, started to present um, some data that he gathered over the last year. 
which was studying stroke rates and how, especially the Europeans in the long course under breast are swimming at a much higher rate. Um, and I think there was some statistic about the number of males that were under a minute in the long course under breast in 2012, and I think we had like one or two, and uh, there were 16 males in the world that were under a minute. And uh, again, the upkick on the finish on the finish of the breast kick. I really think that um, for athletes that can do it and stay balanced, that there is some huge advantages. And I'm, I got a video here that um, I've seen a lot of athletes that that upkicked uh, very well, but they didn't necessarily. They were doing it during their glide. Um, this is probably one of the first videos I've seen where uh, the upkick continues into the out sweep to actually create higher tempo. So hope, I think it's loading here. Okay. So this is Cameron Vandenberg, and uh, this is him charging through the back half of the swim in London, and you can see that the up kick is really connected from the end of his breaststroke kick. He's kind of seamlessly kicking back up towards the surface, but I think the difference is really that he's connecting it with into the out sweep. So he's using it to get through the out sweep quicker and with more force. He's really eliminated one of the only I mean, real non-propulsive times in breaststroke. He's eliminated it by continuing to keep his keep foot pressure on the water. So my hope is that with um, the uh, gigabytes of information that Russell has, so the next time I see his presentation, he'll have a, he'll have some more evidence of that and the way it's been used. Um, so if I can get into the questions, I'm gonna wrap up my presentation and um, see if I can make this bigger. There we go. Thanks. Hmm. Uh, how much do the weight belts weigh? Uh, that depends on the athlete. Um, I think the girl that you saw in the front, uh, she probably had on around 12 pounds. Um, it, there's different amount of weights. The, the, the weight varies by whether or not it's over their head or on their waist. They can obviously do a lot more when it's on their waist. To kind of go back to the Paul Bergen reference, he told me that Allison Wagner could do 35 on, 25 off for, I think, 20 or 30 minutes with 30 pounds tied below her, um, which I've never seen an athlete do anything like that. I've seen an athlete be about 20 pounds. Um, but over their head, uh, 8 to 12 pounds, stronger guys might be 12 pounds. On those, uh, on those vertical swims, they're probably 10 to 12 pounds because they're on um, – they're shorter, and I'm giving them a good amount of rest in between. Um, what fins do you like for breaststroke kicking? What age to start that? Um, we we do breaststroke with fins throughout the program. Um, I am not particular about the fins that we use. Uh, we don't we don't have anybody with the breaststroke fins. In fact, I uh, my one experience with those breaststroke fins that allow you to swim breaststroke and have that like hook off the pinky toe. Mm -hmm is that it, gen it took a really good breaststroke kick and sent it straight to the bottom because of the way the angle of the thing catches. So um, those are something that we don't, that we don't use. Um, but most of what we're doing is uh, just trying to get them to go up tempo. Uh, do you have any other drills besides pull boy to help swimmers, keep swimmers from dipping down? Um, I do, we just talk about it so much that your thumbs have to be on the surface. Uh, dolphin kick, if done incorrectly in workout, can absolutely generate uh, a downward dive. And we talk a ton, that's why we talk about kicking at that specific time, because I think most of the people that dive towards the bottom, dive towards the bottom because they kick too early in their recovery. If they wait until their elbows lock, they're already in an extended forward position, and they end up shooting forward across the surface versus diving towards the bottom. Hmm. 
Uh, head position, I think uh, Dave Silla teaching where he's head is looking two to three feet ahead versus looking straight ahead. Actually, okay, let's see if I can expand this. Which maximizes stroke length and torso width. Um, so I think this has to do with um, what I teach about where they're looking when they're in the middle of the breath. And um, I, I do think it is two to three feet ahead of the extension of your hands. You should not be able to see, I don't think, you should be able to see the end of the pool uh, when you're in the middle of the pool. You should um, just be looking with, if your spine line is locked in, you should be looking two to three feet. That, that's pretty accurate uh, in front of where your hands are going to extend so that your neck stays neutral. That's really what we talk about is that the spine and the neck are as long as they possibly can be. And we talk about, you know, your lungs being the center of your buoyancy and having body mass on the front of, um, on the front of your body. Well, the only way you can do that is if you keep your neck as long as possible. Um, just be patient while I'm scrolling through these. Um, all right. Is there a way to scroll back up? Or is that a thing? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, how important is it for athletes to keep the elbow in front of the shoulder in order to keep the drive and the stroke? I think that just goes back to how much body mass is behind your lungs and how much body mass is um, in front of your lungs. And I think that you have to keep your, you have to lean on the stroke at all times. Um, if you think back to that one pull, two kick, you can see how quickly she was getting through the breath and back into the glide. I think that's just fundamental. Um, the, just going back to the concept of ratio of time, you're above the surface versus below the, below the surface. You want to get through it as quick as you can. I think that's actually pretty good. Um, I uh, thank you. I, I've enjoyed talking to you today, and hopefully these concepts will give you a really good uh, path forward in working with your own athletes. Again, good luck this season. <laughs>